Hello, I'm Christopher Finn and I'm your host for Think Retro on Macworld. And I'm here today in London College of Communication to talk to my old, and I do mean old, uh, friend and colleague Keith Martin. And we're talking today about hypercar. Yep. This looms large in the minds of Mac users of a certain vintage. <laughs> yep. Doesn't it? Uh, what was hypercar? Uh, Hypercard was a software toolkit in a sense. Uh, it was uh, an open-ended piece of software that you could use to make your own software, basically. It was an app for making apps. Yes. Uh, in fact, we got, I got a really good um, quote from um, Uli Kuster on Twitter. Um, and Uli runs Hypercard.org, one mm -hmm. of the great I fan sites him, uh, um, towards the, uh, the retaining the memory of Hypercard. He described it as a discoverable software erector set that works like your brain and the real world work, rather than forcing you to think like you. Yep. Which is a good way of putting it. Yes. And his point about being discoverable as well was the fact that it wasn't a black box. You could bring up a window and see the output of the actions as you step through, so you could live debug what you were doing. Yep. Yes, it's live, live runtime, and uh, yeah, it, it worked the way you thought. Yeah. yeah. So what, what, why was it important? No, the way did it come out? It was like, well, it was. Uh, it existed in 2GS first, didn't it? 2GS? Yeah. No. No? I thought it was. Uh, Bill Lake, well, Bill Lakinson wrote it. I mean, he, it's, there's a lot of history on this. There, there may be sort of, uh, sort of early sort of antecedents. Of the, the so I, I was told by Blake Patterson on Twitter that um, the Hypercard 2GS, which had colour. Okay. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, yeah, well, I could be wrong. But Billingson, as you see, part of the original Macintosh team, yep. developed it in the 80s. Yep. Yes, and uh, it was something that was just given away as part of the, uh, the Mac, or what wasn't called the Mac OS there, but the system. It was just provided so that people could make their own software as well as just use off-the-shelf things. Why, why did it, why is it, why has it still got such a big cultural, it's just still such a big cult, cultural touchstone for people in the Mac community. Why was it, why did it make such a big impact? Well, before Hypercard, well, there wasn't a great deal that you could do. You could just buy software that somebody else had come up with, and I uh, hope that it kind of satisfied the needs of what you had. Uh, with Hypercard, you could just figure out what your needs were, figure out how to build your own solutions. Yeah. And that's just incredibly empowering. So it's that sense of empowerment. Suddenly, it's like the promise of BASIC years before, except easily. And it was graphical as well, and based on a... On a Stack of cards metaphor. Yes. That it made it approachable and easily parsable, as you see, work yep. the way your mind wanted it to work. Yeah, you just put a button on a card, tell the button what you want it to do, click the button, and it does it. When we tweeted out on the Macworld account or on my account on Twitter and asking sort of why it was important, one of the most common responses I got back was that it got people into programming. And just as one example, Dan Council, the Real Mac software, has given us Rapid Weaver and Clear and now Typer, Type was just out. Uh, said Hypercar got me into programming without it, there might not be a real Mac software today. That was a really common thread that yep. gave people the bug, got them interested yep. in this thing to begin with. Yes, but it got me interested in programming. Uh, I'm not as deep into it as some people, but uh, yeah, it's, it helped me get the love of the logic of programming. And on the act of creation, I guess, yes. rather than using these machines purely as consumption devices, using them as devices that you could use to this sort of meta thing to make into their own things. Yep. I could just make whatever I want. If I can think it, and if I can then think through the steps of how I want something to work, I can make it. But Keith, it's not real programming, is it? Well, of course not. It's, well, the thing is, it's easier. Real programming is boring, time-consuming, and uh, it will give you a massive headache. What about the performance queries, though? Because obviously if you're coding near to the metal, if you're doing very low, well, you know what you're doing for pilot code, but these days especially, but if you're doing very low level coding and you're getting it compiled to run near to the bone, near to the metal, into the future, you're going to get very high performance. There's a lot of stacks and layers of front on top of hypercard that means it's going to be quite sluggish. Yeah, depends what you want to do. A lot of the things that people used hypercard for were, I mean, 99% of the time the software would be sitting there idle. So that sort of performance, sort of absolute raw, sort of metal performance, it's not that important. Yeah. And mm -hmm. it's even less important now, really. It was exactly because CPU, CPU cycles to burn. Yes. 
It was interesting as well, looking at the range of stuff people built with them. Um, Christopher Goldenberg on Twitter said, it was great because I could build an entire RPG on one card at age 15, knowing only English language programs. Yeah. And somebody else who's nearly, I forget, got in touch with Twitter to say that the original driver software for the Apple One scanner was actually itself a hypercard stack. Yes, actually, that brings up that. And let's not forget Mist. Mm -hmm. yep. Possibly the most famous hypercard application yes. of all time. Mm -hmm. Which, to this day, mention it to most Mac users, or indeed most of a computer vintage. users, of a certain vintage, and a little bit misty-eyed mm -hmm. um, as, they, as, they, as they try and do it. I love this one from Mike Kreuzer, or Mike Cruiser. My first unfinished project, a Choose Your Own Adventure 2, was a hypercard stack. First of many unfinished projects. I love that sense that it was the first thing that he right, let's get started with this. Ah, too bored of that. Let's do something else. Yes. Yeah. Well, it, it's so easy to just jump in, and then you, it sparks new ideas, and then you say, okay, save that, go try something else. And you build your knowledge. Sometimes you don't finish building the things that you're actually working on, but you extend your knowledge and also your appreciation of different tools. But it wasn't, although it sounds like it was a thing for making these little toys, it could be made to do really hard hardcore things. This from Kevin Marks on Twitter, we used it to build museum installations with synchronised laser discs and the last chance to see with Douglas Adams, yep. which Douglas Adams I'm sure would have been delighted by. He was a big fan of hypercard. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's quite a, that's a, that's a big thing. Tracy Evans, I built interactive video walls based on laser disc players controlled by Hypercard and 512K Mac. Hypercard was important because it allowed me to transform from a multimedia artist to a multimedia designer. Yeah, yeah a, a lot of people used Hypercard specifically because of that. It was a very easy access way of doing visually quite incredible things and very responsive things. Yeah. Uh, before QuickTime, uh, you had to use laser discs, and life was complex. I remember just trying to get these sorts of things working, and Hypercard was one of the best ways of doing it. It was relatively straightforward, as long as you had the hardware. There's a really interesting quote from Bill Atkinson as well on an interview at Wired.com. He said he missed the mark with Hypercard. I grew up in a box-centric culture at Apple. If I'd grown up in a network-centric culture like its son, Hypercard might have been the first web browser. My blind spot at Apple prevented me from making Hypercard the first web browser. Because it's true, it is hypertext yes. essentially, isn't it? Yes. But in a, in a much more contained way. You could make it work over an Apple Talk, that was fine. Yeah. But it was very much a contained thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the, the promise of that, that Bill Atkinson obviously sees now, wasn't for the viewer. Yes, I mean, it, it was a product of its time. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, you could network machines, but a lot of machines, particularly Macs uh, and sort of basic PCs at the time, they weren't really networked. They might be plugged into a printer, but that's essentially it. Yeah. Uh, so just moving stuff around from machine to machine, that wasn't really what people wanted to do. They wanted to have something they could run on their machines and they could do anything they wanted. That was, that was the joy of it. Now, yes, we're in a networked environment, network world, so we want to be able to reach across fetch things, bring them back, respond to remote things. Yeah. It's interesting as well thinking about Hypercard because we, it, it brings up this whole debate about appliance computing. Now Steve Jobs famously had this vision of computing that it would be like an appliance, like a toaster. Yep. A single function or thereabouts, <coughs> in rough terms, device that was easily usable, but you did have no idea how it worked behind the scenes. And there's always been that dichotomy, especially with Apple, between the sealed box mentality and the tinkerer's mentality as yeah. well. Yeah, uh, I think there's, there must be a little bit of uh, sort of pulling in both ways in Apple, because Apple is both. Apple is about uh, these beautifully crafted solutions that just work, but also letting people be creative and come up with their own answers to things. What do you reckon this legacy is today, Hypercar, that mindset? Well, the mindset, I mean, it's, it's hard to uh, imagine where things would be without Hypercard because they got so many people into creative tool creation thinking. Uh, it's not around today, obviously. It doesn't run unless you work on odd tricks to get it working. But there are other tools around that uh, really do the same sort of things and actually add more networking abilities. Things are moving on. I wondered if you would count things like Raspberry Pi and even Minecraft as being the same spirit as Hypercard World. It's that tinkerers, let's make things work how we want them to work, and the enfranchising ability yeah. of technology. Raspberry Pi more so than Minecraft, I think, for me anyway. Uh, it's very much a hardware oriented one, so it's a lot of the same ideas. I mean, there's Arduino, Raspberry Pi, those sorts of things. 
but for me, it's still the ability to just make something out of nothing. Just to say, run, run a tool software creating piece of software and build something from scratch that does exactly what I need. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing, you could use it, you could pick it up to make a single little task. In the same way as you might mm -hmm. use Automator today, just to make yep. something work for the way you specifically want something to work for this one yep. little task yep. and make it, make it yep. work. I mean, Automator's great and it lets you connect lots of things very easily, but it's not as open as HyperCard. Uh, I've got you just dream something up and then just figure out how to describe what you're doing and just by breaking it down into descriptive sentences you're halfway through to writing these scripts. And it was an incredibly innovative thing as well, it predated, it, it, it anticipated a whole range of stuff. This from Uli Kuster again, uh, so it predated Interface Builder, which is part of the toolkit we have for building Mac and iOS apps today, Xcode, Flash, Photoshop, FileMaker, HTML, Java with the just-in-time compiler elements so it would compile just as you need it to compile, um, Scratch and Automator, PowerPoint, and also Xcode's fix and continue feature which Apple announced and then retracted from Xcode. It was there working in HyperCard. Yep. That, that's an astonishing legacy for it to have been there ahead of all those things. And that's a roster of some of the biggest names yep. and biggest uh, forces in technology today. Yeah, and in some ways, in spirit, HyperCard is like still out front, just sitting there laughing, waiting for things to catch up. Yeah, and you can write it today if you want to. You know, if you go for some emulation, yeah. Basilisk or uh, Shapeshaver, you can still literally run HyperCard. But it's probably going to be easier for most people to use an app that is inspired by it, that, that yeah. retains that legacy. And you're a big fan of SuperCard, aren't yes, you? Yes, I'm a fan of two two tools, uh, both of which are awesome. Yeah, they are descended from HyperCard in a sense. Uh, SuperCard, Mac only, beautifully elegant. Uh, the language from HyperCard to SuperCard is it's practically identical. And another one which is incredibly powerful is LiveCode. Um, they're both ways of just dreaming up software and um, just making it. You made a word processor back in the day, didn't you? I did. I, I called it wordless because I didn't want to use Word. And uh, all I needed was live word count. Yeah. So I built something that had the first live word count and then used it to beat the product manager of Word over the head with for two years until it finally made it in. And That's where it came from. And you used that for years? Yep. And it was the result of a couple of hours tinkering mm -hmm. to create this thing that worked. Just it was what you needed, what you wanted, and you've got years of use out of it. Yes. I mean, it's essentially, at its heart, it's two lines of code. Yeah. Or it's a script, it's not even code. Mm -hmm. And the first line is put the number of words of field work into field count. Yeah. And the second one is uh, put the number of words of the selection into field selected. So unless I radically... That's literally the language. Unless I radically underestimated you then, my idea of two hours work is a little <laughs> overstated. Oh, I, I did a lot of tinkering. <laughs> I made the interface complicated, then simplified it again, made it do lots of other things. And, but that is at the top of those two lines. I wonder if you'd agree that I still see Keynote even as something as part of the spirit of HyperCard. You can use it in the same way. It's, it's only the sort of multimedia offering part of it. But yeah, if you wanted sense. to, you could build stack-based interactive game. You could build Mist in, in Keynote without any uh, great problems. And there's also a slight database element. You can bring in some stuff from number of fields. Mm -hmm. there, are, there, is, there are elements of that you can mash together. I think, it. I think it, it's theoretically you could. I think in practice, it would, there would be a lot of walls in front of you. I think to do something like that, Go for live code or super code. They are the ones that actually still have that uh, sort of the lid is off. You can reach in and make things. But there was a there was a, a, a damning indictment from Stanislav posting at loper osorg about these new equivalents, things like SuperCard and LiveCode. He said all of them are failures for the same reason. They insist on being more capable, more complexity laden than HyperCard and thus none of them can readily substitute for it. And there's an element of that that's true, because mm -hmm. HyperCard was so focused and so light and yet so open-ended. That's where its power is. Yep, to an extent that's definitely true. In LiveCode you can write stuff that works on practically any platform you can make. So it has a broad range of abilities and that does complicate it. Mm -hmm. uh, you can ignore a lot of that though. In both SuperCard and HyperCard, you can just say, okay, I'm just going to deal with a certain subset rather than trying to work directly with the uh, TV engines or lighting to network sockets. Yeah. All the stuff that you couldn't do in HyperCard. 
So if you actually just use the range of features that Hypercar had in the modern tools, it would probably be about as simple. You obviously still love it. You've got a great affection yeah. for it. Well, my, yeah, I did my dissertation in Hypercar. In this very building? It's, yeah, in this college. I've come back and sort of teaching you. But uh, I did my dissertation on QuickTime when it was in beta and wrote it as a Hypercar stack and handed it in on Cypress disk, 44 megabytes, chunky great metal platter. Um, it got thrown straight back at me, of course, because they thought, why isn't this printed? We dealt with that. But yeah, you can use Hypercar for anything. That is a good point with which to end, and if you've got um, fond memories of Hypercard too, or even if you're still using it or using its direct descendants, things like Supercard and Live Code, um, let us know in the comments below. Uh, thank you very much for watching. <laughs>